All right, so I want to start by thanking you. Um, you really welcomed me into your community, and I have learned so much since yesterday. Uh, it's really been an honor to be here, and uh, Father Nathaniel and Nick, thank you for your hospitality and for putting together such an extraordinary program of thought leaders and critical thinking about how to move forward on a key issues in our world today. So thank you. Um, I'm going to start with a confession, uh, actually two. Uh, the first is that I am not a doctor. <clears throat> uh, I am a reform lawyer, and I am totally intimidated by the uh, thinking and the scholarship here. But you're not going to get a scholar as I speak to you. The second is that yesterday was fabulous in every way, but one of my favorite moments was when Susan said, as she was speaking, um, I had to look up humanitarianism, and I went, oh, thank goodness, because so did I. So thank you for that. Um, for me, humanitarianism is really concern for the welfare of all people in every way and something that is experienced as both a religious and an ethical imperative. It's from that context that what I'm going to share today um, is Tannenbaum's work with the people who are on the front lines because our work is really behind them and behind the scenes. First, a little context. Tannenbaum is a secular and non-sectarian organization our focus is on combating religious prejudice, hatred, and violence in a range of different ways. That means that we're not ever promoting religion or denigrating it. What we're doing is recognizing it as a powerful force, one that's evident in this community, and looking at the times and places where our differences in belief can cause conflict, and looking for solutions to those conflicts. Our approach is practical, and our focus is on long-term social change. Um, so though our full name is the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding, we don't do dialogue, though we know that it's a key tool in humanitarian work and in, in conflict resolution. Instead, we work in two areas. One is everyday work, everyday conflicts, things that show up for all of us. So we work with educators in schools. Why? Because kids are getting bullied on the basis of their beliefs. We have a pedagogy, we train them in. And the goal is that educators will help children to know that being different is normal. It's not an aberration, it's not something to fear. We work in global workplaces. Why? Because people bring religion with them when they go to work. Some people need a space to pray. Some people need special food when they go to the company um, event. Some people celebrate a holiday that's not the same holiday as everyone else in the company. They need accommodations. And when you treat your employees with policies and practices that are inclusive, it's actually a win for the companies because they have happier employees, more productive employees, and they make more money, which is why they are in business. We work in healthcare because people bring their beliefs to their decisions about what they're going to, you know, what they're going to do with what the doctor tells them. The doctor or the nurse doesn't recognize this. They may not be given complete care. And our goal is that every person, no matter their beliefs, be respected and get the quality care they need. That's our work in everyday life. Our, focus in, our second focus is in armed conflicts, in conflict zones, and in post-conflict situations. And we do that by looking at the individual. <clears throat> Excuse me. We look for those people who, because of their faith, because of religion, are pursuing peace, whether or not it involves risk to them. And it's their work 
and how we work with them from behind the scenes that represents Tannenbaum's humanitarian crisis response program. We call these individuals peacemakers in action. And we select them every two years, uh, and we select two each time. We have a, an international nominations process and an advisory council of specialists, practitioners, scholars who select from among the candidates. We had 40 nominated this year, and there are five criteria for selecting the one who is most suited to be named a peacemaker in action. They have to be driven by religion, first and foremost. They have to do work at the local level. That doesn't mean that's all they ever do, but they have to have worked at the local level in an armed conflict or conflict zone. Their lives or their freedom have to have been at risk and they have to be relatively unknown, so not the Nelson Mandela's uh, and the Gandhi's of our world. Out of every two, we now require one to be a woman and the second to be a woman or a man, and I'll get to that later. Today, we have 26 living peacemakers in action and they're working in 22 armed conflicts or post-conflict zones. Becoming a peacemaker in action started out as an award, but over the well over 15 years we've been doing this work, the program has changed, and today it is much more than that. Anyone who is invited to become a peacemaker in action has to sign an agreement with us. They will work with us, and we work with them in two ways. First, to document and analyze who they are and how they do their work. That means what is their motivation? How does it drive them? How does that influence them? What do they do? Because being a religious peacemaker for us is what drives you and your vision. It's not per se what you do in the middle. So some are educators, and some are like Father Sava, who is one of our peacemakers, and. Um, who we documented in the first book, but I will tell you he would not cooperate with me on this because um, he says that he does nothing alone as an individual. It is all through his community, and of course that is true as well. But he is also a person who does great work. So in our work, we try to talk about their work and document their techniques. So we do books like this one. This, this is, I'm very happy to say, our first volume because the second one is really going to come out. And I know that for sure because we finished the conclusion the first night we were here. Um, so I'm very excited. And um, so it should be out later this year. And it tells their stories. I'll put it over there so you can look at it. Um, in it, we discuss their most frequently used techniques. Um, and Father Sava who is one of our peacemakers, as well as um, Archdeacon Theodore, who should be one of our peacemakers, um, exemplify several of the techniques, like the power of using communications for peace building. That's one of them. Or the power of the pulpit, the power of the authority of the church to convene and provide care and networking. In our work, it's clear that many of our peacemakers work at the front lines of some of the world's greatest uh, crises. And so our goal in documenting this and doing books like this is to influence you, to influence uh, universities, seminaries, areas of higher learning, because we believe that these individuals are representatives of a real field, a vocation of religious peace building and humanitarianism. And that this should be a recognized vocational option for study. The second way we work with our peacemakers is far more hands-on. Um, we work with them through working retreats, and what has now become our Peacemakers Network. So 
We've had five working retreats. We would have had more, but we've all talked about resources, and resources can limit what you can do. We've had five since 2004. The first one, we brought everyone to Amman. And while we were there, they got to know one another and to know us. And we provided professional development training. We brought in experts. Within short order, we actually determined that w there was hubris in our bringing experts to the peacemakers because they are the experts. And they now train one another in our working retreats in their techniques and what they do and how they do it. Um, at our third retreat, they were together again and they challenged us. And they said, you know, we were people who were very alone. You bring us together every few years and we have a sense of community and then we leave. We call ourselves a network, but we're not. We're a group of people the Tannenbaum convenes. But we can be a network, and we need to think about whether we should be a network. A network with a shared vision that becomes a learning community and a community of practice. And a few years ago, that's what they did. They established a network. They are a peacemakers network. They have a leadership group. And we work with them. We now, they charged us with having a network coordinator. And so we convene them for uh, Skype calls where they're sharing of information, conversation, and ideas about some of the world's great problems, but also a building of community and learning that allows us to sometimes do targeted interventions in armed conflicts. So I'm going to talk about one of them. Um, one that we recently did in, in the Syrian crisis. Before I do, I want to tell you about one of our peacemakers, the one who spearheaded this intervention. Hind Kabawat is the daughter of a diplomat, a lawyer, a journalist, uh, a public relations specialist, uh, a graduate of the Fletcher School, a conflict resolution practitioner, and trainer, and a socialite. She's also orthodox, and she sees the divine in all people. Before the crisis began, she was involved in civil citizen diplomacy. She'd met a rabbi, his name is Mark Gopin, Rabbi Mark Gopin, uh, who had been doing work in Israel. And they decided that their people, the people in Israel and the people in Syria, should know one another because not every Israeli was a, a Jew behind a gun, and because not every Syrian was an enemy. So she invited Mark to come to Syria, which he did, and he was afraid, frankly. Um, he was not sure what it would be like for a Jewish rabbi to show up in public places uh, in Amman, but he came. And, at, and Hind structured several big events, but one was with the Grand Mufti in, I believe it was the Damascus Library, I may be wrong. And during that set of conversations uh, about peace and about the importance of our shared humanity, a man stood up and talked about Abu Ghraib and what had happened to him there. And Mark was moved, and he went to him full of emotion, and he said, on behalf of the American people, I apologize. And this was captured on television. It was broadcast widely. And they were beginning, and then the Grand Mufti embraced Mark. And this was, again, captured on television. They were having some success, but we all know what happened. So Hind, still very committed to her country and to peace building, shifted her tactics and her approach. And she is part of the story of what's going on in Syria today. At first, her efforts were targeted at trying to stop Assad from attacking the opposition. So she, because she was you know, in social circles, got to Assad's wife and she begged him. She said, tell him that he has a choice. 
He can choose to be Mandela or he can choose to be Milosevic. Tell him to make the right choice. Well, we know the choice that he made and she found it unbearable and so she has aligned herself with the opposition. And what she does, although she's now situated most of the time, but not all of the time, in DC, she goes and tells the stories of the people. You can find some of her work on the Huffington Post. But she also does other things. So she go to Turkey, and she has slipped on a burqa and snuck into Syria to deliver humanitarian aid at great personal risk and to deliver comfort and to say you're not forgotten. And she proudly tells me, which I, I kind of gives me a chuckle but makes me very happy, obviously, Joyce, it is all my Jewish friends who give me the food and the clothing. So there you go. Um, but she also conducts interventions. And the intervention that she planned and needed the help of some of her fellow peacemakers involved creating conflict resolution training designed to address extremism, sectarian division, transitional justice, and reconciliation for civil activists within Syria. They came out of Syria, they went to Turkey, they went to Jordan, and she provided these trainings, but she needed help from her fellow peacemakers. And so we were able to support sending two of them to work with her. Friar Evo from Sarajevo, who was involved in the Bosnian crisis and now does post-conflict peace reconciliation work, and is Nozizwe Madlala Rutledge, a Quaker from South Africa. This is one of the ways we get involved, providing training for those who need to lead this country from behind now and hopefully one day in the future. I now want to turn to some of the things we've learned in all of this work, some of the trends that we see in religious peace building, and just name a few for you that I think are worth noting. The Peacemakers Network, is not unique. I'd like to think it was unique, but the fact is that people are creating, it, it is unique in the way we do our work, and what is quite unusual is how when we name a peacemaker, we don't leave them after the award. We try to stay involved and keep them connected. But the concept of networks is everywhere today. There are networks of organizations, there are networks of peacemakers, there are networks of locally based religious actors. This allows for sharing of knowledge, this can have a multiplier effect, it can also involve, quite frankly, wastes of time. So part of our network understanding is that sometimes our peacemakers can't be with us and can't sh show up on a call because they have other things that they have to do at home that may be more pressing. But we still would love them to come whenever they could. With the great resources of the Orthodox community, the teachings, the institutions, the people, the organizations, this is something that I suggest respectfully that you note and that you get involved with more so. Um, second thing, trend has to do with religious leaders. In this field, there is a tendency to talk about religious leaders and working with religious leaders. I had the privilege of sitting on a foreign policy subworking group to develop recommendations for Secretary Kerry on how to mitigate and prevent uh, conflict and violence and how to work with religious leaders. And I was probably a nuisance to the group because I lobbied for a change in the focus. Rather than talking about religious leaders, <clears throat> I urged them to talk about religious actors. Because when we talk about religious leaders, what we're really talking about often are the men who are leading religious institutions and the men who represent the religious institutions, some of whom are peace builders. But there are many other people 
who because of their faith are putting their lives on the line for peace. Women and men. Some of my examples. Bishop Natambu in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is a peacemaker and a religious leader. But Dishani Jayawara, a Buddhist from Sri Lanka, is also. And so is Nozizwe from South Africa. And Nozizwe and Dishani are not religious leaders in their traditions. They have no established titles, but they are religious peace builders. So to state the obvious, when we use the terminology religious leaders, what we're really doing is marginalizing women. This tendency to overlook women is pronounced. It is not something that just kind of happened by language. I know that because in my history at Tannenbaum, we would solicit nominations from across the world. And we invariably got nominations of men from men, nominations of men from women, nominations of men from themselves. <laughs> and we almost never got nominations of women. And that's why we created a women's peace initiative and began selecting women peacemakers. But our board changed that and said, no, we're not selecting women peacemakers. We're selecting peacemakers in action. And we're going to make sure that women are not overlooked because we're going to require that out of every two, one must be a woman. And that's how we got to that policy. There is change happening around involving women. It is terribly slow. And that is because of inbreded, embedded attitudes. I'm going to tell you one very quick story. A leader of one of these new networks working with religious leaders, very proud, has two foci. One is working on extremism, the other is on including women. And then he announced at a conference that was about gendered responses to extremism. So he was talking to a room full of women. He said, we have to let the women in. That's not accurate. The women are doing the work. We have to recognize that they're doing the work and that they are part of our community. When you use religious actors, something else happens as well. You also get to include youth and indigenous people. You don't limit yourself to those with established churches. One third trend, evaluation. We've talked about it. I'm not going to talk about it much now, just to note that there is increasing demand for it. Some things can be evaluated, and we should. At Tannenbaum, we do that. We have an evaluation and monitoring program. But it is not always easy, and not everything is tangible and measurable. And some of this work really is about relationships. And that's very hard to quantify. So a, a few thoughts in, in closing um, on going back to the goal of this you know, colloquium, which is igniting action to fully engage with humanitarianism. First of all, peace building is not linear, and it's long term. Quick story. Reverend Bill Lowry worked in the south of the country of Sudan with Nuer and the Dinka. He held um, the Wunlet Conference, which was a people-to-people -people diplomacy effort where they listened to one another and came to a peace agreement. And for years it held. And they stopped stealing cattle and kidnapping children and women. And the death stopped. And then the country of South Sudan was born. And that period of peace has evaporated, notwithstanding his and other people's best efforts. It's not linear. But we can have periods of peace. And I think our responsibility is to keep in mind a vision of a lived peace, where everyone in a community is treated fairly and with respect, 
and has equal opportunity for life and benefits of the community. Secondly, and I go back to what I referenced before, religious peace building, religious peacemaking is a proven vocational option. It's defined by one's drive, why what moves someone to act, and by the fact that what they do is always seeking to bring peace and stability to their communities and to their people. Our job can and should be to nurture that field, to institutionalize it, to train seminarians and lay leaders in this field, to provide certificates and degree programs, because we can learn. There's learning to be done around how to do this. We need to acknowledge this vocation as a reality. We need to recognize it and support it. And we need the church and government support in paying people to do this work so that they can. This would have longer term uh, impact and um, if we do this, what we will see is that government officials, diplomats, civil actors will work more and better with religious leaders, with religious actors, with religious communities. And when they do, we increase opportunities to pursue peace and to create healing societies. Tannenbaum's Peacemakers in Action illuminate this reality. They illuminate this vocational choice. We have Father Sava as one and his community behind him and their work in social media, track one and track two diplomacy. We have Bishop Natambu in the Congo who works with the cannibal tribe, the Mahi Mahi, and has established peace with them because they respected him for his integrity and his commitment to peace as a religious person and religious leader. We have Jamila Afghani in Afghanistan who's working with imams to look at the Quran differently, to understand that women are to be respected and not threatened or menaced in any way. And of course, we have Hind Kabawat, whose Damascus home is right around the corner from her Orthodox church. Hind, who's working to save lives, provide humanitarian assistance, prepare for peace, and to envision a lived peace always in her Syrian homeland. Thank you. Thank you.